Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today is abundance teacher and money coach, Jody Lynn Creighton. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. Jody Lynn, this is a very different episode because mm-hmm. I can't ever remember. Well, no, I remember one other time this actually happened. I'm interviewing with you. I'm interviewing a, a, a guest who I've actually met in person. That almost never mm-hmm. happens. It's mm-hmm. so rare. And and the last time it happened, I think was about four years ago, four or five years ago. So it's been a while. And what I can tell you also, um, our, our guest today is Benjamin J. Lee. Ben is uh, a, a, has a remarkable story, very interesting story. We'll get to that in a moment. But one of the things that really jumps out from the very beginning when you talk to him, at first, he seems very um mainstream and so forth and then you find out he's very woo and you say oh this is so cool i love it, <laughs> I, love it. I, I won't give you any more than that because i want you to discover this for yourself but i wanted to give you a heads up like th- this is this is going to be a fun conversation so first of all ben welcome to the program thank Glad you for having me. me it's nice to see you again too how you doing you as well i know i missed last month's meeting so I look forward to oh, well, what's wrong with you. I mean, that's what meetings are for. Don't you realize that? <laughs> Unfortunately, while I get the nonprofit up and running, I have to work part time jobs. So, that oh, geez, you know, w- real world is uh, horning in. Is that I, what you're saying? Yes, this physical reality can be quite the nuisance sometimes. It, it is, it is true. Yes. <laughs> but uh, before we get to that part, let's give people a little bit of your background. Tell people kind of the story that you told us at the group meeting, you know, where you came from on all this and how you ended up where you are now. Oof. Okay. Um, well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Benjamin John Lee. Uh, I am a retired Air Force bomb squad technician. Uh, I did three tours in the Middle East, two in Iraq, one in Afghanistan between 2006 and 14. So that's actually my job by trade, I guess you could say, is defusing bombs. Um, however, I started losing the use of my right arm somewhere towards the end of my career. Uh, due to not being able to feel the nerves in it. Come to find out many, many years later, it was because of an old Achilles heel injury, weirdly, that was doing something weird with the nerves in my spine. But anyway, uh, so I got out of the military, became a general contractor, did housing renovations and new build projects and stuff with my brother. Uh, around the pandemic time period where it became really difficult to do any sort of work inside people's houses or you know, being around people in general, I decided to become a fine woodworker. So I actually used YouTube and taught myself how to do like very fine woodworking. So mantle pieces and curios and gun cabinets and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I was still recovering financially from getting out of the military. So like I was, I had like a makeshift wood shop inside of like a carport outside. We had a really bad windstorm one day and it just took like took everything away, destroyed all my tools, oh. destroyed everything. And so I'm sitting there staring at it. And I'm like, well, I guess it's time to pick a new direction. Yeah, right. The yep. universe just tapped you on the shoulder with a two by four. Yep. Uh, so, so I was like, you know, electrical really interests me. I've seen a lot of electricians in my work as a general contractor. So I became an elect- electrician's apprentice and started training under an electrician. Uh, but then like a year later, I went uh, to like trade school because there is a schooling requirement portion for getting your electrician's license. And it was while I was in electrical school that I started noticing some pretty severe inefficiencies in our nation's solar development program, actually not just solar, our renewable energy development program, mainly being that we don't have one that (laughs) seriously, we're devoting billions of dollars towards renewable energy projects that are just going towards lining the pockets of large corporations and big businesses fly by night companies are scooping up money and disappearing it's it's not great um but i guess more is what it sounds like actually well yeah i mean just the status quo for how our government runs things lately anyway um but I, well, I guess it's not just lately ben i can tell you i'm a student of political history this has been going on for generations that's that's fair um but I guess more specifically, um, I while I was that time period where this idea came to me, um, I, I was struggling a lot with with lack of purpose. Like I I knew that I had more in me. I knew that I wasn't living up to my potential, 
the, I was looking around at the life that I, I don't even want to see, say created for myself, the life that I let create itself around me due to like my lack of involvement in it. And I'm like, what on earth am I doing here? Like I God, I hope she's not listening to this, but the woman I was with at the time, I'm like, what? I don't look, we have nothing in common. Why am I with you? You don't make me happy. My job, like my job doesn't make me happy. My environment doesn't make me happy. Like, what am I doing here? And I realized how comfortable I got with just being a, you know, an NPC in my own life. And so it was right around that time that like, I started praying hard, not to, not to God, but just to anything that would listen. To Whoever's me. listening. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Is there anybody out there? <laughs> anybody out there is listening. Uh, and weirdly, um, I don't want to say a voice, but just like a, a knowing came to me. And it said, if you fix yourself, we will give you purpose. Mm. And I was like, okay. and mind you, at this point in time, I was. God, I was drinking three monsters a day, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, taking 40 milligrams of Adderall just to function. And mm -hmm. like, so that next week I stopped my entire life and went and sat on a rock next to a river for like six months and wow. got clean, got sober. Like it's still a struggle to this day, but like it was worth that period of, of <laughs> difficulty to, because say, say none of this comes to fruition. I'm still like super proud of the man that I've become in the last year or two. And like, at the end of the day, that's really all that matters. So during that period of time, as I said, this knowing came over me and over the course of a few weeks, like this, this plan, this project is what came out of the ether, this new method of renewable energy development that's under the nonprofit umbrella that will not only lay the backbone of a future America where no one has to pay for residential energy ever again, but will ensure our energy independence from foreign fossil fuels. So it, you know, takes care of the people and the country at the same time. And by the way, Ben, I, I didn't give you a clue in before we started here, but Jody Lynn actually lives in Canada. So you're you're going to be also bleeding over the border and, and you know carrying some ideas over there as well. Just just yeah. thought I'd point that out. Gotcha. I have no idea how things in Canada work, other than they're much nicer than us, apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> <Sorta. laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, we, I think it's very similar in the way that you were describing, like there's this insane push to renewable resources, but not really any direction. And it's very frustrating. We have a carbon tax here. Um, so it's making life harder and harder to afford. Um, but it's not actually doing anything. Like if you were to look at the, I have, I have very strong opinions about this, <laughs> so I'm sorry. But um, I, I, if you look at the net number, like the amount of trees that we have, um, you know, we're in the negative output position, but our politicians don't talk about that. They talk about how we need to change. We got to get out, out of oil and gas and just into solar, or just into wind and you know, like we've had many brownouts or blackouts or whatever, rolling blackouts um, this winter that started happening because they're trying to do this transition, but they don't have the infrastructure behind it. And it feels like there is a lack of direction and transparency. And it's all about lining someone else's pockets, which is really frustrating. So it's very similar. Y yes, except weirdly, I don't think it's a case of maliciousness. Not immediately. I think a lot of the problems that we're facing, at least here in the United States, are just a product of this system that we've built for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like everybody has to have their hand in everything. Regulatory agencies all need a say on the way that we're developing things. And what, one of the biggest driving factors behind me wanting to pull energy development under the nonprofit umbrella is uh, I'm looking at the writing on the wall in terms of if we let the free market dictate where energy development goes. And it's not good. You know, mm -hmm. we only have 30, 35 years left before our fossil fuel reserves really start getting to dangerous levels. And based on the last 10 or 20 years where we've gotten started in renewables, 
for profit is just dragging this in every different direction. You know, oh, oh no, wind's better. Oh no, solar's better. Oh no, you know, hydrogen's better. This is, and it's like, can, can we get on the same page with the direction that we're headed and, you know, implement an actionable strategy to get there? Yeah. Like that, that's what I'm about anyway. I love that. I think that's important. And I love the idea of taking care of the people. You know, when you start researching how electricity came to be or the history that we know, it was, you know, Tesla had free energy and then all of a sudden that was gone. Like it feels like in a lot of different arenas, including the electricity world, there's a lot of really cool inventions and a lot of ingenious people that were silenced or put down, <laughs> you want to put it, um, instead of helping the whole, we were looking at individual profits for corporations. So I love the idea behind what you're doing for sure. I, I do think it's an idea that is only capable of existing now though. You know, we, we give the free market a lot of crap, but like it takes money for development to happen. And that money has to come from somewhere. We just find ourselves in a very unique position where there is a ton of government subsidy that's available right now. The only issue is, is that subsidy is being scooped up by corporations, both rooftop and utility scale to go to subsidize their profits. Mm -hmm. I see an avenue where we can use those subsidations to build infrastructure. And then that infrastructure also provides revenue to further develop renewable energy yeah. while at the same time, giving the excess energy that it produces back to the people. So, and being a 501c3, we can bring in the interest of corporations and businesses that would be giving uh, tax donations away anyway to meet their yearly quotas, except now they have an, a vessel to put their, their corporate social responsibility funding into where they're going to get the tax write off, but then it's also going to go towards uh, establishing green energy infrastructure, which is then going to go towards supporting people. So they kind of get to double dip on their marketing and corporate social responsibility dollars. Mm -hmm. so, so starting with the idea of the nonprofit, that's one of the main things that, that starts to differentiate you from other solutions that have been proposed. But you have a much broader vision of that involved than, than just the nonprofit part. There, I mean, there, there's a whole there, there's a whole landscape to be described here. So let's lay out that landscape so people know what we're talking about. Okay. So the solar security net, I name the solar security net as such because I want to reinforce the future of America's social security, but with the revenue that comes from renewable energy sources. So if anybody's wondering about the name, that's where the name comes from. Which, by but, the way, is a very daring idea, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's actually a, a three-phase program or plan or my vision to where the steps we need to take to reach a carbon neutral energy independent future here in this country. So my vision of an energy independent America is actually one that relies heavily, almost evenly distributed on nuclear and hydrogen. Wind and solar are great energy sources, but I think that they're actually transitory to get us to meeting our hydrogen production quotas that we need to reach to start seeing technology emerge that is going to be like truly carbon neutral and truly renewable. Um, the only problem is, is that, do you know the difference between gray and green hydrogen? No. So green hydrogen is hydrogen that is, is zero carbon. It comes from renewable energy sources like solar and wind. Gray hydrogen is cracked using fossil fuels. So uh, coal gasification or using natural gas. Only 17% of all of the hydrogen that we're using today is, is green hydrogen. So it does us no good to create a, a carbon neutral fuel source if it takes fossil fuels to create that fuel source, if, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Totally. So I looked at that problem a lot is how do we close the cost gap between gray and green hydrogen? Because Green hydrogen is right now about four times more expensive than gray hydrogen to produce. So obviously nobody under the for-profit uh, banner is going to devote resources into making a fuel that they can only sell for, you know, four times less than the, than the other guys. So I was thinking about this and like, okay, how do we close the gap between gray and green hydrogen in an effective way? And the only thing that I could come up with was somebody who is in control of a 
vast amount of renewable energy infrastructure has to eat that cost differential up front, like be willing to say, hey, I will eat this profit loss so technology can can advance to the point where these you know two technologies are equal to one another. And when That's you say like, up front, do you mean that as a short term thing that, that ultimately changes into something else or is this going to be ongoing? It's going to be an ongoing uh, loss that has to be eaten. No, eventually the technology will meet those two production methods in the middle. It's just your fossil fuel driven sources have had hundreds of years lead time on renewable sources in terms of efficiency and technology. So uh, ideally, you, we just need to eat the cost gap long enough for people to go, oh, hey, there's going to be a massive surge in hydrogen fuel let us capitalize on that surge and then they are going to start creating more efficient hydrogen technologies and then as we expand renewable energy technologies those are also going to become more and more efficient so mm -hmm. the more we put into that this the faster that those two uh metrics are going to close in on one another mm -hmm. um so yes yeah, somebody needs to eat that cost differential up front but again you're not going to convince anybody in the for-profit world of doing that so that was when the method of nonprofit renewable energy development, you know, popped into my head, which was, hey, um, there, the money is already out there to get these things built. It's just the people who know how to access that money are accessing it and building for profit renewable energy infrastructure. So I need to put my knowledge and expertise into use for the nonprofit sector because somebody at some point is going to have to do this or else we're just sort of doomed. So j just a few things to highlight. Um, in the United States, we have a program called the Re uh, Inflation Reduction Act. It's essentially a $27 billion-ish dollar pool of money that was set aside for greenhouse gas reduction uh, infrastructural development. On top of that, there's a program in that program called the Justice 40 program, which means that 40% of all of that funding has to go towards programs that are benefiting disadvantaged communities, which works out well for us because there isn't a whole lot of people developing energy right now that are directly benefiting uh, disadvantaged communities. So we have access to that pool of money. And then as well, uh, there's a tax rebate program called an investment investment tax credit which as soon as a renewable energy uh, installation is grid tied 30 percent of the overall cost of that installation is returned to the developer oh, wow. um yeah in, in the form of either a payout or a tax rebate so a lot of these companies that are developing infrastructure have tax liability so they just apply that to their tax liability to reduce their their overhead we as a 501c3 don't have a tax liability and as part of the Inflation Reduction Act is that investment tax credit is actually transferable. So we can sell that tax credit to another company that wants to support green energy development for upfront investment dollars. And then they get the tax credit on the back end. Mm. So there, all of the funding is already out there to make this happen. What, what we're trying to establish and fundraise for right now is just to set up the, the lattice of the actual corporation. So, you know, hire the lawyers that we need to hire, the grant writers, the project managers, which will then give us access to that bigger pool of money. And then we can just start solar development pretty much the same way that for-profit solar development works. It's just all of our energy on the back end either goes towards increasing renewable energy infrastructure development or towards our charitable purpose, which is supporting disadvantaged communities. And just to be clear, who are the we and the we that you refer to? I mean, you've, you've made mention of, of we, but who, who is this? I mean, well, who is this amorphous group? <laughs> uh, technically, the we right now is me, so I sound like a crazy Oh, okay. Person, but, <laughs> I, I mean, I we are a corporation, so I do have a board. They're, mm -hmm. they're just a couple of friends that help me establish the legal framework of the corporation as mm -hmm. we get going. But I, mm -hmm. I am seeking motivated people to join my board, you know, people with connections and and money and power to join my board and help me see this vision through. I mean, that, cause that's the only way this is going to get done. Uh, so, so when so I this say is truly, this is like seed level startup. Correct. I mean, and tr people think that a for-profit startup is a hard thing to do. Try doing a nonprofit startup, <laughs> yeah. like try going to people and convince them, Oh, Hey, I'm not like, I'm not going to have a revenue stream, but here's why you should help me get done mm -hmm. what I'm trying to get done. Like mm -hmm. it has been, I feel like Sisyphus trying to push a boulder up a hill every day and just mm -hmm. having it roll back over me <laughs> every day. But yeah, sure. it's, 
it's made me stronger. So I, mm -hmm. I'm thankful for that. That's always a good thing. Yeah. Um, but but you do have some people, um, some friends who are kind of on board with what you're doing. But you're you're the main uh, engine behind it. That and obviously that means you're like you're saying you need to increase your team because they'll burn you out faster than anything else. I've. I've hit that. In fact, after this podcast is over, I've already decided on taking a week where I don't think about this at all. <laughs> Not a bad idea. <laughs> I, I've started to reach that burnout point a few times because it just, I'm consumed by it. Like, and I, even with my meditation practice, even though I know that all of this, like, is going to work out, like, I've, I've seen it already. I've seen this successful in the future. I, but I still need to, like, recognize that I'm a human being with, stress and cortisol levels <laughs> and so i need to you know be smart about where i'm putting my focus most of the yeah, time yeah yeah it, i mean th it's a daring uh venture which I, by the way i admire i i i'm engaged in a, not as daring as this one but i'm engaged in my own daring adventure and they are terrifying and they are potentially exhilarating and actually they're kind of a lot of fun <laughs> what Maybe else is the point of life well yeah that's you, right you want to play it safe but like, so what when you're on your deathbed you can tell your kids like i i fulfilled the status quo it's like no 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 i want to <laughs> i want my grandchildren to be gathered around i'm gonna be like let me tell you how i did something amazing like mm -hmm. what why else why else exist well that's not the uh attitude that most people would have it's it's an unusual attitude I, but i'm just telling you i admire it because yeah. i mean that that's how i feel about it i i, I think kind of jody lynn's really the same way so we're mm -hmm. you're, you're in pleasant company on on that particular mm -hmm. point especially <laughs> well, so you. tell us more about uh, where you where you, you want to go with this thing i mean obviously you've got uh you're gonna be pushing like perseus like perseus you said you're gonna push that boulder uphill but let's assume you get that boulder uphill where where does this go so it's actually a pretty What's great is I do have a few buddies who like, I had been talking about this, you know, for years now, I'm almost like a little over a year and a half that I've been like really pushing this. And one of them the other day, cause I did another podcast, uh, called behind the brand with direct line studios. And as soon as he watched that podcast and I, he had the opportunity to hear me like explain this out loud. It like, it clicked in his head and he was like, Oh my God, I get it now. Mm. So let me try to explain this in the same way I was explaining it to him. Okay. So because we're because we're trying to eliminate every residential energy bill in the united states we had to pick a bar and start somewhere and because the funding that is most readily available is that which goes towards supporting disadvantaged communities that's where we're going to start so sure. we're going to we're going to pick disadvantaged communities like here in connecticut the first one that we're focusing on is, is willimantic connecticut oh, okay. so the way of the energy world is now going towards virtual power plants and virtual net metering programs. So your energy infrastructure doesn't have to be located all in the same place. Like the reason that for-profit renewable energy developers build massive fields in the same spot is because it's more cost efficient. Like you're getting, you're getting efficiency of scale that way. Right. But as a nonprofit, we have the latitude to spend extra money in certain places that for-profit developers wouldn't necessarily consider. So instead of going for a 400 acre piece of land, I could go for four 100 acre pieces of land and consolidate that energy into the same location. So we're going to be picking small towns that have low populations, but high land mass, like here in Andover, Connecticut, which is my hometown. So we build a field here. 25% uh, of the energy that that field generates will go towards the town that agrees to host the building of the field. This is a strategic way of advancing the developmental hurdles in the renewable energy process, because one of the, the biggest hurdles in renewable energy is that local communities are voting these projects down. They don't they don't want them in their backyard. But if we can come in and say, hey, you know, this project is going to actually eliminate your residential energy bills right off the rip. Not a lot of people are going to be opposed to that. So mm -hmm. by building relationships with the local communities, we can build in better off towns that are surrounding disadvantaged communities. And then the other 25% of, or the remaining portion of that bottom half will then get delivered to that disadvantaged community. And essentially we're trying to use net metering. So, any of the energy we produce is just banked up with a local power provider 
and then people become members of our nonprofit and then their overall energy usage is just deducted from our total. So it's like a paperless, completely easy way of managing this project. Uh, and then I keep messaging or mentioning top half, bottom half. The top half will be sold in much in the way that for-profit energy providers do, except ours is going to be rolled back into the corporation and then go towards subsidizing the development of even further fields. So we're creating a snowballing green energy portfolio of publicly owned solar infrastructure, essentially, that will self-proliferate and then take that bottom half and then use that as our as our host region allotment and then our charitable purpose allotment. Um, and, and then so like this, even if we get 20 megawatts built here in Andover, that's not going to cover all of Willimantic. Obviously, that covers roughly 67 percent of Andover and then 8 percent of Willimantic. However, what we can do is copy and paste this to other surrounding towns. So mm -hmm. hit Coventry, hit Columbia, hit Mansfield, hit stores. And then, you know, once you get a network, social security net, you get your network of solar infrastructure surrounding your disadvantaged community. But at the end of the day, all of their residential energy is completely free. And then most of the surrounding communities as well. And then late stage, what we do is in those disadvantaged communities that are the central hub, we build hydrogen production plants and that top half of energy that we were selling to expand, we actually devote that energy to our hydrogen production facilities, rectify the energy and then use electrolyzation to create the nation's largest supply of hydrogen fuel. And, and, and what do you foresee? Yeah. I mean, what, what's the goal uh, with creating this uh, large supply of hydrogen fuel? What, what, what are you hoping happens with that? Um, that is where our ener the energy independence comes from because we have all of these uh, like carbon metrics and all of this legislation. Like we we keep thinking that we can legislate ourselves into a carbon neutral future. We can't. Yeah, good like, luck with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like you, it, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so we need, as I said before, clear, actionable strategies to get us there. So like okay, this plan is not going to be an overnight thing. Like our first plant wouldn't even be operational for two years. But then as this, the further this goes on and the more resources we get put into this, the larger and wider this net will spread. I, I plan on taking this to all 50 states. And then you have hydrogen production facilities located centrally to each one of those states. So we, it, it, it sounds to me like what, you, what one aspect or key aspect of what you're trying to do is not only are you laying out this this idea about how the whole thing can expand, but you're trying to do it in a way that kind of I, it, this is a weird term to apply to something like building power structures, but it kind of goes viral. You're, yep. you're, you're hoping for a viral aspect to kick in because people say, say, they got this really cool thing happening over there in Willimantic. Let's get that going on over here. That's exactly why the social media aspect of this is so important is because like, as I said, the money's out there, but what I need is the attention of the everyday citizen, because the more they talk about it, the more I'm going to draw the attention of the corporations and politicians that I need to get this done. Sure. And, you, you know, if town B over there looks over and says, hey, you know, town A is getting their energy for free. We want that in our town all of a sudden their politicians are going to start mobilizing to get this plan located in their area. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I said, like I'm trying to move towards a world where we see decentralized energy production because all of our plans keep focusing on these huge facilities. You know, we're going to, Oh, well we need to, to create a hydrogen pipeline across the country. So we, it's like, no, we don't No, we don't. All we need to do is be smart, smart about the way that we're developing our infrastructure, decentralize it. And then, like, as I said, you have your main hub of hydrogen production with your solar surrounding it. Then you can put hydrogen refueling stations for our transport fleet around those centralized areas again. And then your your distribution network is super short. You don't need a pipeline. You just need tankers, which we already have. So now, is this going to work for the entirety of the United States? No, but that's where we need to supplement with larger forms of renewable energy like nuclear. But like that's that's not my wheelhouse. So I can't really speak to that. But I, I want to throw something else in here, too. Sure. Um, and I, I'm not even going to address the, the the question about whether it's going to be enough. We, we probably won't even get to that because there's not going to be enough time during the show. Maybe we come back for another show and talk about that piece because that one could sure. be a whole hour. But the thing I want to mention here is you're doing something 
you're, or at least you're attempting to do something here that I have been waiting for people in what I will generically call the green movement to do since I was very young. Because what we've gotten from the green movement throughout the years has been all the things that are wrong with the current situation. And it, they constantly beat that drum over and over and over again. And then uh, the people who are resisting what the green movement are doing, they start beating the drum about what's wrong with the green movement. And everybody's beating drums about this is what's wrong. This is what's wrong. This is what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And you're the first one I've heard come along in a long time who says, well, screw all that. Here's an idea of how we can actually get to where we want to get to. Let's actually take some steps that could be productive. And now we don't have to really worry about who's right or who's wrong about, you know, it, are we up against a, a global climactic uh, apocalypse or is this all a bunch of nonsense? Who cares? It doesn't even matter at that point. That's, this, all you just, that conversation just disappears. You just said a key word. Notice how I have not said climate change once. I appreciate that, by the way. This, <laughs> this entire strategy, and I hate that this is the case, but it, it lies heavily on branding. So this plan had to not just appeal to the left and their, you know, green morals or the right and their infrastructure strategies. It had to rest on the razor's edge right in the middle where it's not only is this program going to go towards supporting infrastructural development and the prosperity of our nation, but at the same time, it's going to go towards providing economic relief to disadvantaged communities and, and you know, setting up a more sustainable future. So it's like, this plan had to come in perfect harmony right in the middle to where it's like both sides can grab a piece of this and go, no, like I want to get this done because this is important. It's like, okay, well, I created you a plan where both sides of the aisle can latch onto this and run with it. Yeah. So and, and it doesn't even matter whether it was uh, balanced on a knife's edge. It really doesn't. I mean, because actually, no matter what you do, I don't care what kind of business you run. I don't care what kind of nonprofit you set up. There are going to be people who don't like what you do. It's True. just that. So, so all that doesn't really matter. What really matters is, do you have something that can not only benefit, but that people can latch on to, regardless of what their political beliefs are? That's really what the strength of what, of what you're doing is, I think, from my perspective, anyway. Well, I don't thank know what you, you think, Jody Lynn, but you know, yeah, Jody I, nodding up and down, so I think probably yes. I agree, <laughs> yeah. I think that that's wonderful. Not only do I see that, like you see all of the parts of it. You see how this could be a different way that, you know, we get our energy, but you could see how it helps the disadvantaged. And then eventually when it gets so big, you know, the communities that are signing up for this, they're reducing their output costs. And like everybody's talking about inflation these days. And I know like, I don't know how it works in the States, but in Canada, we have like distribution fees and transmission fees and all of this shit Same on way. our bills. <laughs> and like, I, out of my monthly electricity bill, I'll use $40 and it'll be 220 because that's all the extra charges and people are getting nickeled and dimed to death. So it's refreshing to see something that not only helps the environment, but helps the people at the same time. I like that. In fact, the, well, thank you. Like a nickel and diming is probably too generous. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's, exactly. I'm actually worth more than the bill. It's like twenty, twenty dollar bill in it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, and we need a new like this is the the issue that I have. Well, actually, you know here. what it is? It's Ben Franklining because ben, ben Franklin is on the hundred dollar bill, and Ben Franklin right. was the one who discovered the use of electricity. So there you, know, you go. It's yeah, it's Ben Franklining <laughs> it. The thing that frustrates me um, so much here is that they just talk about what's wrong and like, we need to shift. We need to shift and like, okay, so what's the plan guys? Like let's go all electric cars. Okay. Yeah. We, we get minus 40 here in the winter Celsius. I have no idea what that is in Fahrenheit. Hey, believe and, it or not, minus 40 Celsius is also minus 40 Fahrenheit. Well, there you go. Yeah. It so really <laughs> it's, it's freaking cold. And the city that I live closest to, I live outside of a city. I live on a farm. Um, but the city that I live closest to decided to buy all electric buses. And you know what? They haven't turned a wheel. They've all been sitting in the stupid garage that they built to house these buses because they don't work in our climate. And it's so 
annoying to see billions of dollars being spent on garbage. Like, let's actually take a look at what's going on in these environments, these places, and how we can have win-win scenarios. And Benjamin, I think you're doing exactly that. And I think that's why people will love it because it's a win-win. It's a win for the environment. It's a win for the community that you're doing it in. It's a win for other communities as well. So there's that selfless aspect of it. There's a tax deduction for big corporations. Like it all makes sense. It's a brilliant plan. But by the way, it also occurs to me that once, you know, let's look around X number of years in the future. And in your community, Jody Lynn, they, they, they start to make this kind of shift between the kinds of things that Ben's talking about. And then those buses, somebody wakes up and says, hey, let's sell them to Mexico. They've got lots of sun. It'll put, you know, let's get our investment back out of that. Yeah. You know? Now you get, now you're back into win-win territory again. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that the more I think in our society today, so I teach about money. Uh, so, you know, Benjamin, that's a big thing in my life. I teach all about money and abundance. Um, so I, I think that our society is so ingrained in how do I make more? How do I have more money so that I can get by and I can have all the things that I desire? And I think that's the wrong question. I think we need to begin to ask, how can we reduce the cost of everything so we can enjoy our life instead of this incessant, you know, turnover of I need more and more and more and more and more. And energy is a huge piece of that. If if you didn't pay for energy anymore, how different would our lives look? How different would society look? It'd be a completely different ballgame. So in case you hadn't figured it out, Ben, you, you, you're, you're on a show here with people who are very sympathetic to what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I knew you would be. Uh, and, and especially the route in which I came about it by. So because I I'd love to take credit for being a genius, but I'm really not. I just in a moment of clarity was able to channel something that obviously has been begging to have been happening for a while. So that I just genius. Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to squash my ego. <laughs> I've been reading a lot of Marcus Aurelius lately. So I, <laughs> in fact, I was just reading meditations at lunch. So like, I'm trying to really hit my, you know, my stoic stride and be like, mm. <laughs> this is Marcus Aurelius month, because literally I had a guest on, on Monday named Marcus Aurelius Higgs, who is very much into meditations. He had a copy of meditations. He held it up to the camera. And two weeks ago, Joel Elston and I did a conversation about, Marcus Aurelius's contributions to Stoicism and the development of the Stoic philosophy. I mean, this is this is Aurelius month. It's what it, it is. I, I love Aurelius. <laughs> I mean, I love Stoicism in general. I mean, same with Taoism, although they're almost essentially the same thing, in my opinion, anyway. But I'm not a philosopher, so please don't tar and feather me for there's saying that. Plenty of, of overlap. I mean, I'm yeah, about it. there's overlap in every single spiritual and religious institution. Mm -hmm. They're all saying the same exact thing, which is. Just stop focusing on yourself and start focusing on everything around you. Like you'll be much happier. Stop, <laughs> stop worrying about me, 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 me. Start worrying about us, we. Like okay, but it's very hard. It's very, very hard to do that. Well, it's also. I, I think it's more than than focusing on uh, outside. It is focusing on me in a sense of the inner me, not the one that's the ego one who's, who's trying to manipulate the world, but the one that that's connected to whatever you want to call it source energy or whatever that that me that's the one where all the, that that's where the genius comes from i mean you, you you said you kind of got this in a moment of clarity that's where it came from i agree but i guess it's just a perceptual stance where i think that that little me or that inside me is we like i, I think okay there's a through that's thread fair. that connects every single one of us yeah and like so to say me i don't know i think that's just disingenuous i i call that me we okay yeah, that, but isn't the me just, the we? So aren't they the same? That, I, exactly. <laughs> it's all it's all the same. <laughs> so you can say me again. Okay. <laughs> Even though I won't. We. we. I'm actually learning because I'm a tradesman. Like I, I'm a carpenter and a, like I'm a. I got a potty mouth. Like I'm not like a corporate guy by any means. But learning to like teaching myself to come on interviews and you know articulate what I'm doing. I've had like I've had to train myself to start saying we, you know, because I'm representing a corporation. We are a we, not a me. Like I can go, oh, this is my plan and I'm doing this. And it's like, no. Like, so I had to actually very purposefully 
practice saying we all of the time. And so I guess it's just bled over into my spiritual life as well. Mm-hmm. So, so, so basically we're, we're raining on your parade. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I don't have a parade to rain on. No, okay. <laughs> it's a we's parade. We have a parade. <laughs> oh. Oh, that's yeah. funny. what what kind of uh what kinds of response have you been getting because you, like you said you've been doing the podcast circuit or starting to do the podcast circuit now and uh doing i, I think you men- made mention of social media outlet outreach but you hadn't really talked about that in great detail but but uh with with the outreach you've done so far what kind of responses are you getting none uh w- let me backpedal it is none but i've noticed that man this is one of the hardest pieces of information to try to turn digestible like society's attention span is 30 seconds maybe 45 seconds and it's like i could sit and have a conversation about this plan for six hours easily so to digest all of that information down into a bite-sized clip that somebody will go oh hey i'm interested in that it's it's like what did you watch like the GoFundMe promo video? The like three minute and 30 second one? I haven't no. That, that's on the website. It's on the GoFundMe page as well. But like three minutes and 45 seconds was like the best I could do. And even then it only makes sense through the context of if you've heard me talk about it on a long form conversation like a podcast. So like when we first released the fundraiser, I had every single person I know, including my public relations guy, my video producers, their network, and then the, some other networks that I have, like launch this out on social media. With, but I mean like literally zero response. But I'm, I'm like, look, I try to zoom out. I try to look at it from a bird's eye view and I'm going like, th- this isn't, this is gonna be something where I have to dig my heels in and just keep doing media appearance after media appearance after media appearance because all of the the virtual latticing that i've set up for fundraising and information is only valuable if you get interested in it through a longer form conversation so doing interviews like this and having conversations like this this is going to be the part that really solidifies this plan because once people hear it once they understand what i'm trying to do they get very interested in it you know they say like how can i help you know what can we do but just at a cursory glance i don't think people even understand like people hear the word solar and their brains immediately shut off just because of how predatory the solar industry is down in the united states i don't know how it is in canada but well not just because of the solar i mean solar is such a a a hot button topic for so many people from a variety of different viewpoints that any any time that you say that word regardless of what context you say it in it's going to trigger somebody within their own context whatever they think about it and and, yeah. and it doesn't even matter what you say you say solar they think the thing they always think about solar yeah it, you, people mention like rooftop solar, and it's like nope i don't do that people, for profits nope i don't do that either and it's like, okay so it's it's just going to be a process of refining the message and just continuously putting it out there like com- actually like conversations like this because you know you're not energy x ex- well you're not that sort of energy expert. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we, we, we dabble in yeah, energy. You're, you're, you dabble in energy, different kind of energy. Uh, this isn't source energy. This is uh, DC energy. But ha- having but isn't people... it all we? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Joey. <laughs> um, well, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you have okay. a lot around here, Ben. It's okay. You got, you got to be used to it. That's all there is to it. You know? Uh, <laughs> DC. I I was, oh no, I was somewhere else on that. I forget. That's right. It'll come back. It always yeah. does. Yeah. And if it doesn't, it wasn't that important. Well, yeah. it probably is important, but but maybe we can kind of tease it out. Sure. Because um, because what I wanted to to kind of take us to next is yes, what you're up against is a, a massive challenge. One of the things that I've been learning with my own massive challenge that I'm dealing with is something that I picked up just from doing this podcast. From talking to people like Jody Lynn. I've had hundreds of guests on the program that I've learned so much from over the years. And I think I told you about that during the meeting that uh, you attended that day. Um, One of the things that I've learned out of that is the people who succeed with the the wild stuff, the crazy stuff, the stuff that you you hear the story and and you, you 
there's no way anybody would ever submit it as a script to Hollywood because Hollywood would never buy it because it's, it's just too unbelievable. But there are plenty of people who succeed with that. There's one thing that they all have in common. They simply don't stop. Hmm. They just keep going. And they, they get failure after failure after failure after failure. And then all of a sudden something succeeds. And, and the other story that goes along with this, Joel was actually talking about this on uh, the program the other day uh, that I did with him. He said, he, now he um, Joel is a life coach, um, kind of like Jody Lynn, but he he doesn't focus quite so much in the territory that she's in. He's, he also has a therapy background. He, he is a former psychotherapist who gave up his license because it was too limiting. But he, he aims more toward the, uh, the mental health side. And he has a number of clients who are uh, very well healed, high end. He, ha he has a number of billionaire clients. Um, and he was talking about how, particularly with uh, kids of billionaires, how it's kind of rough for them because they, they have everything handed to them on a plate. So they don't have the kinds of experiences that most people have where you know they, they have these hard things that happen, the terrible things that happen to them, and they have to kind of grow through them and so forth. They don't have that. So, mm -hmm. so they're constantly pushing boundaries, trying to basically trying to create those situations for themselves. Um, the reason I mentioned that is he also referenced what he has learned about how those families became billionaires in the first place. And he says that the, the pattern that always plays out is that they struggled and struggled, they failed, they struggled, and then all of a sudden something happened and it exploded. So it's not even something where you can point to it and say, well, here is the method to how they, they became a millionaire in this very structured way. It doesn't work that way. It's no. simply somebody who just kept going and going and going and going and going, and then they finally stumbled on something. Yep. I mean, I, I've known that from day one. Like, I've known how big it, and it might surprise you, but this is only step one in a very long-term plan that I have. Not for... surprised at all. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> I don't know about you, Joe. I don't think you're surprised either. No, this is, you know, this is as early. This is, this is seed before there's a seed. <laughs> Correct. Because my, my passion is actually not energy. My passion is politics. Like I care about people. So this is just a springboard to something much larger that I'm working on. Uh -huh. But I, I've known from day one that this was going to be an insurmountable challenge. But I also knew that things aren't until they are like, I, I could talk till I'm blue in the face till the cows come home. All it takes is one person to hear what I'm doing with the means and the resources right. and the will to help me. And that's all it takes. Or, or the, maybe not even all of that. Maybe, maybe they don't, they have just a, a, a small piece. Maybe they have the right person to connect to. Maybe true. they, maybe they, they know about somebody who's doing something similar and they connect you to together. I mean, that's the thing. You can't advance, predict how hmm. that wow moment is going to happen. True. If you try to, you actually undermine your own process. I've actually been learning that lesson lately. Hard I way, keep, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, because <laughs> I, I, I keep waiting for that wow moment. You know, mm. that, oh, well, when is when am I going to feel successful? You mm. know, because like that's something I struggle when when you make the sacrifices you have to make to attempt a challenge like because to, to anybody listening, there like if you want to do something big, there are going to be sacrifices you have to make. Like you're going to have to pinch pennies because every dollar you're making is going into this dream that only you believe in right now. Like right. there's going to be a loss of sleep. There's going to be a loss of friends. There's going to be family members who don't understand what it is you're trying to do. And like to keep your momentum, you have to keep those people out of your field. So like during all of that, you just have to stay focused on, on the end, which is, it doesn't matter how long it takes me to get there. It doesn't matter what difficulties I go through to get there. Everything that I go through is just, is just fuel that I'm going to push into this furnace in my chest to push forward and get this done. So like the, waiting for a wow moment is already an exercise in futility. Like you, you need to be your own source of comfort, your own source of motivation, your own source of discipline or else like you're not going to get anywhere. Which is exactly what Jody Lynn teaches, by the way, as part of her coaching program. Uh, I mean, well, that's really the foundation of it, isn't it, Jody Lynn? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, that's just what I've picked up from living a hard life, a, a hard life that I've made hard on my own, by the way. Like I was, <laughs> isn't that always the case though? <laughs> oh yeah. It's like, I was by, I mean, I didn't have it amazing. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but like if I just went the normal route and live just a regular tradesman, find a wife, have some kids die happy life. Like I could have done that very easily, but like, no, nope, I'm the one who had to like get addicted to a bunch of substances and like, 
ha- have a bunch of issues with self-worth and and validation and being able to forge emotional connections with you it's like it's it's all on me 100 percent on me it's just i didn't want to i didn't want to do the work that it was going to take to get to the other side of those issues well until i did i think everybody reaches a breaking point where they're just like i've, I've had enough of this like i'm i'm done being small and i'm done not living up to my potential and that can take a number of different forms it, it can take the form of a crash and burn that's actually probably the most common form of mm-hmm. crash and burn where, where, you know, life seems to fall apart because of some horrible event that happens or, or it can be a much more mundane thing where it isn't so much a crash and burn. It's more like a dead end. And like, I don't know where to go here. I'm kind of stuck. And you know, I stay stuck for a while until it gets really, really, really unpleasant. And then I finally say enough, I can't do this anymore. I got to go change. I got to do something else. And it, there are a lot of different ways it can play out. But I, one thing that I do know for sure, from having the show for like about the last 12 years and interviewing all the people I've interviewed, the pattern is the same in that everybody has some moment like that one. So I think you're, you're, you're right on when you say that's the key. That is the key. It's fine. It's what's that moment for you. And, and we don't even know what it is. I mean, very often, even when we think when we know what it is, we find out later and we'll know that really wasn't it. It was the one that was coming after that one. I mean, we, we, we can only ever really know by looking back 20 years and say, that's where it happened. Well, there's going to be many too. It's not just once. Yeah. Like well, yeah. you, you might, you might have one that started the dominoes, but right. like there's exactly. going to be many, many after that. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Jody Lynn, now you don't get this kind of client. I don't think too often, but if you got a client like Ben, what, where, where do you work with somebody like that? Uh, from, because you're, you're, I mean, this is my way of saying it. This is not the way you, you say it, but you're a money coach. You coach people yeah. on, on how to, uh, uh, understand money, appreciate money, how to f- have a better relationship with money so that they can have a more abundant money lifestyle. If you're working with Ben, how do you work with Ben? Because he, what he's doing is really off the beaten track. Totally. Um, I'm going to ruin the ending because I can't. <laughs> <help you now. laughs> I, I, for, for you, Ben, I would say, Benjamin, I would say, uh, the world that we live in, the possibilities are endless. There's billions of possibilities that exist, billions of ways that this can come to fruition. But I would really remind you of what you're doing. And I wrote some things down. In the life that we have today, our society, and this applies to everything from energy to the way that we deal with ourselves, we think it's always been that way. It has to be this certain way. But that phrase or that ideology of it's always been that way is no longer good enough. And you are someone who is already doing it, Benjamin. You're like, I'm waiting for that success to drop in and to feel it. You're there. And this is the reason why people are inspired by greatness. And your idea, your philosophy, the way that you see this adage of it's always been this way is no longer good enough is the inspiration, is the molecule of expansion that people are seeking, especially now in this ascension time that we're in. So that that ideology of inspiring others, you're already on that path. And that takes a bold step, which you've done in creating this company and courage. And people are eventually going to see that. So I think your tagline needs to be, we're creating a new world. It's always been this way. It's no longer good enough and free energy the way it was always supposed to be. And I think that when people understand that our world can be anything that we want it to be, we're not held to the bounds of what society says it should be or was supposed to be, and we crack open that door, they'll begin to see more and more crazy ideas like yours that just make sense and where people want to flock to it, to see and to bring forward this idea. And you are on the precipice of this moment, Benjamin. Well, I thank you for your encouraging words. I do. You're welcome. Especially this week, I, I needed to hear some of those. So uh, I'm glad you I'm glad you think that I'm there. Jody Lynn just gave me a clue too, because uh, at the end of every episode, I always have my co-host summarize the thing and she was giving me the clue that, okay, I'm gonna do the summary now. We got about- <laughs> I'm going to yeah, hold it. 
which is cool. I love that. Uh, I, I'm going to kind of pile on with it too. Um, I grew up in the era when the original Star Trek series came to fruition and was on television and we, we would be glued to the TV whenever it was on the schedule so that we could you know, see the latest campy episode of Star Trek. Um, and and it, it's obviously a television series that has greatly influenced our society today. I mean, we, we have you know, we, we have communicators. We have, we have a lot of the stuff that they were already talking about in the show. But one of the, the uh, episodes came to my mind, especially when Jody Lynn was, was doing that little bit right there. Uh, it's, a, it's an episode where uh, Kirk and Spock end up in an alternative universe, or actually Kirk ends up in an alternative universe where there's an alternative Kirk and an alternative Spock. And the alternative Kirk is basically a, a dictator warlord kind of personality. The Spock is more Spock-like than than the Kirk is, and he ends up getting the alternate Spock to help him get back to his own universe. And at the moment that they're going to do that, of course, using the transporter because that's what they use the transporter for for everything, right? So you know he's on the transporter pad, and the alternate Spock is about to beam him over to his own universe through this special crazy thing that they set up. And he says, "Mr. Spock." Remember that in every, revolu in every revolution, there is a single man with a vision. And what he's referring to is his recommendation to Spock that the existing society that Spock lived in was illogical because it was this authoritarian-driven system. Mm. He had also just told Spock that there was a device in the alternate Captain Kirk's cabin that enabled Captain Kirk to maintain his power over everybody. And that if Spock got a hold of that, basically he could turn the tables. So his message was in the context of that show. It was the message of, you know, it takes one man to to shift this whole uh, this whole scene around. But really, that idea doesn't just limit itself to that episode. It applies in every area of life. There mm -hmm. literally is, with every revolution, one man or one woman with a vision. Mm -hmm. that's, that's that's the starting point. That's what leadership is. Leadership is the ability to focus individual beliefs into a large beam of productivity essentially like people don't give belief enough like credit they think of it as something woo woo it's like no no no, no. belief is something tangible and if you can get enough people believing the same thing the kind of changes that you can make are you can't even fathom them mm -hmm. because they're so vast so like what you're saying i 100 percent agree with that it is, it is the duty of a leader to provide people with a vision in which they can, they can see the future through. Like if you don't know what, what's the saying, if, if you don't know what port you're headed to, no wind is favorable. It's like, yeah. you need to know what you need to know what port you're headed to. So yeah. well, at least have yeah. some idea. You don't even have to know what the final destination is. You have to have yeah. a direction. Correct. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm trying to provide the nation that direction. Mm -hmm. And I think if I could add on one more thing, I think what's really inspiring, too, is a lot of people today in our society are saying that there's nothing we can do about this. Like the energy is the way that it is. We use fossil fuels. And like here in Canada, there's just going to be a carbon tax and they're going to try and tax us to death and say it makes a difference. Like it's not making a difference. Like, but there's this overwhelming sense. And it's so frustrating of people saying there's nothing you can do. Like your distribution bill is your distribution bill. Good luck with that. Like there's nothing you can do. And instead of taking that stance, Benjamin, you said, no, there is something you can do. And I think more and more people will see that as an opportunity for something that they can do too, whether it's contribute to the cause or get their local governments on board or whatever, or just talk about this idea. So it gets on the you know right hands and hearts of the right people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest thing people can do right now to help. I mean, other than if they're able to financially contribute to the fundraiser, which I'm sure will be provided somewhere, is talk about this. Like if, if you have a favorite news program or podcast program, like write those hosts and tell them about what I'm doing. Cause I'm just, I'm trying to create relationships with as many personalities as I can, because these are the kind of conversations that are going to get us to where we need to go to. So, yeah. yeah. And since we never really know which connection is going to make the difference, I love your approach because you're just saying, well, I'm going to make connections. I, I'm not going to, you know, try to pre-plan it. I just want to make as many connections as I can make. Yeah. That's the way to do it. I agree. That's fabulous. It it's a slog, but it'll it is. be there. Yeah. yeah. It's a slog. Yeah. On the other hand, it's also how we look at it, right? I mean, we, you can look at it like it's a slog or you can look at it like it's an adventure. Hmm. 
I do love conversations are my favorite thing in the world. So yeah. like if my job is now that I get to have conversations with a bunch of new people, count me happy. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's what fuels you. That, that, that keeps you going. Yes, it does. It that's does. How it's, you it, it's the moments alone above a spreadsheet or behind the computer. That's where like my faith starts to waver. But as, yeah. soon, as, I'm, <laughs> as soon as I'm with other people or having conversations like that's, that's where. Well, that's well, where well here, here's a little clue for you in case you hadn't figured out, spend less time behind the computer. I'm able to now. I had to. I had to get everything set up to take my hands off the wheel. But now I'm at the point where, where I can start just having conversations good. and push this along. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we we made reference to the fact that people should be able to reach out to you, but we should also tell people how to do that. I mean, we'll include in the show notes how they can do it. But tell people how to reach out. How do they find you? Um, I haven't quite had time to establish my full social media outreach yet mainly because we're going to be turning that into like an interactive development, uh, an interactive way to way to interact with the development process. So as soon okay. as the development process starts, starts getting going, the social media will be there uh, for people to interact with our development. However, if you have any comments for me or want to reach out to me, or you have, you know, any leads for me, you can either reach out to me at CEO at solar or okay. media at solarsecuritynet.com. I'm also on LinkedIn and Solar Security Net Incorporated has a LinkedIn page as well um, if you want to connect with me there. Uh, and then the fundraiser is just at uh, gofundme.com slash solarsecuritynet. Okay. So we'll make sure that we get those links into the, the show yeah. notes, make it easy for people to find. Yeah. And then the website itself, solarsecuritynet.com has much more information. There's a, a massive PDF with our developmental strategy for phase one. There's another podcast episode on there with a much more in-depth technical look at the program. Um, and then just a short promo video on there as well. But solarsecuritynet.com has a lot more information. I like to think to myself, wouldn't it be fun if that that one first magic call that you need came through this podcast? Mm. Why not? Why That'd couldn't really it? Fun. Why couldn't it? Yeah. That'd be really Why fun. not today? Why not your show, Walt? Absolutely. I, so before I went to that meeting that I met you at, I mm -hmm. told you I – the night before I had no plans and I was like, Oh, I'm just going to open up meetup and see what's going on. And I'll meet up that, that there meetup the next morning was there. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to yeah. go to that. And I'm that was where get. I met you. So yeah. you never know. That, divine that, guidance. That, that's, that's exactly what it is. Divine guidance. That, that, that was, Serendipity. Or to put it another way, the signs came your way and you followed the signs. Yeah. That's well, that's where getting sober has really helped. That does. Oh yeah. Being being stone cold sober allows you to listen to your intuition a lot better than when you're filling your body with chemicals. That's people can do what they want, but that's my advice to you. <laughs> well, then if it's, you add on to it, if you pile on top of that, now that you've gotten to the sober stage, now if you pile on feeling happy about it, feeling good about what you're doing and so forth, it just accelerates. Mm -hmm. Yes. The whole process yes. just accelerates. It does. But you have to you have to get used to experiencing low points. Oh yeah. People who use chemicals are used to having their baseline here and spending most of their time up here. True. It's like, you need to get comfortable riding the low points of the wave as well. But it makes the highs feel a lot better, but you're going to have to experience some lows along the way. So we, 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 on this show, we call it a roller coaster for a reason. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'm no, I'm no expert. This is just my life experience. So um, I think you've got it nailed actually. Yeah. <laughs> But Ben, first of all, thanks for joining us on the program. And it was great to see you again. Yes. So thank you so much. And, and I'll see you in a few weeks. The next local meeting. So that'll yep. be fun. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you. This has been really good. Jody, it was great meeting you as well. Yeah, One of the things that I, I like to do at the end of every episode, um, I, I want to do it with you too. Uh, okay. In your case, it's going to be that you, some stuff that you have just started to do and that you're going to be doing more of in the future. But this applies to everybody who applies on, who um, appears on the show because everybody who appears on the show is trying to give back in some way, usually because they went through some sort of trauma, but not always. In every case, they're always trying to find some way to they, they found something that really works for them that they want to share with the world. And, and that's why they come onto the show. And you, you fit that uh, motif as well. One thing that I noticed a couple of years ago is that people who do this well were content creators. And we come on to podcasts and we write on social media, like you're about to get ready to do on a major scale. And we write blog posts and we, you know, we do all this stuff. We're putting out all this free information because we want to make the world a better place. And I noticed we don't get a lot of credit for that. So I figured, well, I'm a podcaster, so I can do something about that. So Ben, on behalf of those people you've never met, never seen, never will meet perhaps, never will see, the ones that you haven't even reached out to yet that you're going to reach out to, on their behalf, thank you for what you're doing. 
Mm -hmm. You're already making a difference in this world. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's really important. And Jody Lynn, as usual, I mean, I don't even have to bring up the fact that you already nailed the the ending. <laughs> I mean, you know, we always save that part for the end. It's just kind of there. It is. We're done. <laughs> she couldn't. She couldn't wait. But I she appreciate it. Couldn't wait. So that was beautiful as usual. Thank you. But um, yeah, and I look forward to seeing you again next week as well. Thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.